this is about web frameworks and about, uh, in particular, about a different kind of web frameworks. Um, I'm guessing that everybody here actually does some kind of web development in one language or another. So um, is everybody here uh, developing in Perl? No, I'm guessing. OK. Um, everybody uh, Python? Um, everybody uh, of the more JavaScript fraction, Express as for example, and the front ends. Um, everybody using something like Go, Clojure, anything more exotic? Yeah, okay, at least one. So, okay. Well, um, I'm coming, not, not really coming from web development. I joined the web development fraction rather late. And um, there is, uh, I was never quite happy with web development um, altogether. It is a rather strange and elaborate tool chain, of course, and it is, um, well, I went through, I don't know, I tried, I think, over 25 different web frameworks um, just to get a feel what is there, like you try editors and window managers, for example. And um, at some point, I realized, of course, there is a reason why we even have web frameworks. And um, because originally, web development was actually quite horrible. So other than actually making a home page in HTML2, um, when then at some point image support came. Um, does anybody remember the GIF patent discussion in the mid and 90s? Um, does image maps mean anything to anybody? <laughs> uh, does anybody know what SSI is, server side includes? Yes, lovely, wasn't it? And hidden fields, let me remind you of handling hidden fields to handle the back button. So, okay, then we have a couple of years forward and then somebody invented ModPerl. And then we put sessions into URLs, if you remember this time. And then actually somebody invented PHP and MSQL and then web development really took off. So, and then we have, of course, the next wave of web development when we thought that XML would be totally awesome and that we should maybe use XSLT, for example, to transform from the browser directly into the HTML target or into other targets. Then somebody invented CSS and um, the use of tables was frowned upon and ever since we can't center things properly anymore. Then we stop writing HTML tags and capitals and everybody at this time, I don't know how many people remember this, but at a, some point um, JavaScript use was actually frowned upon because it was weird and not so well supported and who needed animated websites anyways. So, and then we suddenly came into this era of web development, which I would basically put um, with the release of Gmail's user interface, things really changed massively. So suddenly all this Ajaxi stuff was totally all the rage and suddenly JavaScript was perfectly fine. And then a lot of um, professionalization in web development happened in my opinion. So instead of growing and building everything by yourself, you we got things like Ruby on Rails, of course, and jQuery as a library, which I still value extremely highly. And of course, we then got vomiting unicorns. So also websites suddenly looked a lot better. So you can't get away with a crappy website anymore and um, not have a good user interface. So in, in the culture of web development changed a lot as well. So and. We are now here. In a way, we have um, what I, I mean, the expression uh, web 2.0 is probably familiar to everybody. So we now have web three and a half, of course. And uh, the new JavaScript standard is on the way. Um, Internet Explorer isn't hell anymore. And Microsoft is writing a new br browser anyways. And the upcoming thing will be, of course, web components and Polymer and these kinds of libraries. So 
What we had, for example, in Perl was, of course, the infamous CGI PM, which everybody now hates these days. We had um, a little bit more sophisticated stuff like CGI application, Mason and Maypole, and I think over a dozen other web frameworks one way or another. And then, at some point, at some point, everything modernized, but did websites really change? I mean, what is a website today compared to 1996? I mean, okay, it's not called homepage anymore, and you usually have more than one page, but you have, of course, a lot more varieties in a way. You have, for example, the all the f social um, FUBA websites like Facebook and Twitter and whatnot. You have still the little everyday company web page, which sometimes still is really and honest to goodness um, a home page. You have, of course, shopping to no end. Um, you have a uh, um, non public, um, enterprise domain specific, specialized sub subscriber only websites, um, which uh, you actually usually just see if you're actually working on one of those. Um, I worked on for a couple of companies which has this uh, specific kind of website which usually does deal with web things completely differently than some public thing which is um, optimized for high user count, for example. You have, of course, these days the entire discussion about microservices, which is a pretty old discussion in the end. Um, you have to attempt to have real applications in the browser, um, for example, um, office stuff, email, and games, of course. I don't know how many people remember that uh, with uh, Web.5, uh, HTML.5, um, we actually had uh, that people started developing the first first-person shooters, for example, in browser, and I think uh, the most recent example of what you can do these uh, these days in browser is um, an mscripten based um, DOS emulator which can actually boot Windows uh, 95 in browser. I tried it yesterday. Um, really try it. It's extremely impressive, uh, but it will tear your browser apart and everything will fall down and it's very slow, but it is really, really impressive what you can do these days in browser. And then you, of course, have lots and lots of APIs. Um, Anybody who's interested in API development, um, the website programmableweb.com is still the single best listing for uh, web APIs of all kinds in general. So, okay, so if you have a modern web application, it is a lot more complicated than in 96. You don't open your editor anymore and write HTML. You have a lot and lot and lots of libraries. You have uh, usually half a dozen of different languages, um, ranging from SQL to JavaScript. Um, so is it really that complicated? And um, at some point, um, you have to realize that things are still HTTP. So even with a really, really complex website, in the end, you are doing some form handling one way or another. You have still the infamous back button one way or another. Um, usually you tr still try to fake state somehow in a rather stateless environment. And there's, of course, lots and lots of discussions if you put, should put all the state into the client, the browser usually, or if you should keep your state in the database, or if you, I've recently read an article about um, how to basically treat your database in a rather stateless kind of way so that data is um, immutable. You basically just insert stuff but don't update anymore and these kinds of things. Uh, you still have, Sessions one way or another, faked or not. Um, you have uh, authentication and authorization. And of course, now it has to look good and behave nicely. And there is the very sad state of the mobile web. If you're a consequent mobile user, um, it will drive you pretty crazy at some point. So if you're a web developer, 
um, what are you usually using? So you have kind of the mother of the modern web frameworks, which is um, Ruby on Rails, in my opinion, because it was highly influential and tons and tons of web frameworks are basically modeled after how Rails does it. And then there's, of course, the micro framework Sinatra, and a lot of frameworks are modeled after Sinatra as well. So you have, for example, in the Python world, Django as their Rails and Flask as one of the varieties you can use as basically kind of their Sinatra. You have the same in Perl. You can use Catalyst um, in if you're more of the Rails fraction, or Dancer and Modulicious if you're more of the Sinatra style. And of course, um, as uh, JavaScript now runs on the server side with Node.js, as you have, for example, um, web frameworks like Express. But JavaScript is a different discussion in a way. So you, of course, have a ton of um, Java-based frameworks, which are really completely different from or are mostly completely different from what you usually get with uh, Ruby or Python or Perl. Um, and I have to admit, after looking into Java 8, I'm almost tempted. So far, I really avoided that. And then, of course, you have today um, PHP frameworks, which are really frameworks and not just a conglomerate of weird PHP functions. So, and one thing, I mean, a uh, web application is in a way the new hello world. So everybody basically has some kind of web framework, and I really mean everybody. Um, who has ever done small talk? Okay. Wow, that makes two. And we are in a small talk room, and I brought a small talk example. So who doesn't know the statistics language R? Uh, really used it, or just know it? Okay. Um, Haskell has a web framework. Um, Erlang has more than one web framework, for example. And as Go is the new hip, um, Go, of course, has web frameworks as well. Um, Clojure has a couple of web frameworks. So um, And OpenCobol now has CGI support. Let me, yeah, and some guy actually wrote uh, 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 a kind of a tiny web framework ish thing in COBOL, which is, I think, a COBOL on wheelchairs. <laughs> and it works. You can, you can try it on the web. It's actually, it's a, true, it's a true COBOL application, and you can try it on the web. So no laughter about COBOL. They, they are joining us in this century. So, okay, um, if you would categorize available web frameworks, who has used more than, let's say, five web frameworks? Who has um, his or her favorite to go to web framework? So, um, what, what's, for example, your reason that you favor your specific web framework? Yeah, yeah, for example. And you know it, so it's habit in a way. So um, if you look at a modern web framework these days, um, you usually have um, the tutorial start that you are setting up the web framework. There's some automation process usually that you just call some generating script, and then you have your web application simply have run it. Almost all modern web applications come one way, or uh, web frameworks come one way or another with a built-in HTTPD, at least a tiny one. So you don't even have to s go through all the hustle to actually set up a web server to start developing. And then your tutorial usually starts with the typical roots. This root concept um, in to my knowledge, it really comes from Rails or Sinatra, so from this, from the Ruby fraction. And um, I would say that almost everybody has more or less adopted it the, these days. 
And then, of course, you have your templates. You have, I don't know, I found at least a dozen different template languages, styles ranging from moustache and jade and slim and um, template toolkit and template so and so and template whatnot. So you have a lot of choice there as well. Then you usually do your model these days because um, the uh, contemporary web frameworks are categorized as model view controller web frameworks. And uh, let me remind you that the model view controller stuff comes from Smalltalk and was um, in its origin. I think uh, the first article was published in 78 already and the main article about it I think is from 82. It was about graphical user interface programming. And I can highly recommend to actually read it because it is still a groundbreaking, really, really interesting article which really teaches you a lot. But there was, of course, no web. So if you look at your web framework, you usually have um, some web application, of course. So. Um, this is, for example, in Modulicious, your standard web application where you have some input and then you press some button and do some request and transform data and go back one way or another and get a different cat and so on and so on. So. Um, I've written this web application in Flask, in Sinatra, in Dancer, and in Modulicious, and it looks all the same visually. I set up the same routes. I named them the, in the same way. I named my parameters in the same way. Basically, um, the entire code is in my GitHub, so you can look at it and compare it. It really is um, three different programming languages, four different web, supposedly different web frameworks, but in the end, you end up in a strange way with a very, very similar style. So if you look a little bit more closely, ah, yes, okay, almost down. If you use Flask, for example, with Ginger, then you set up your Roots, of course, the index root. Uh, I have another roots with the cats, and I have another. Uh, uh, I have a, a post root for the cats, and these kinds of things. Then you do your request handling stuff and get, grab your parameters, and so on and so on. And then you have here the Jinja template, which um, simply takes in the variables and displays stuff, and um, has this typical URL for thingy that you actually can redirect things and make links nice, and don't have to. Uh, change things too much and these kinds of things. So if you compare this to Sinatra with Slim, then you have your roots and then you have your kitty root and then you have um, your post for the kitties and then you have your parameter handling and then you have a template and um, I chose Slim. Um, which also goes in JavaScript by the name of Jade um, because it's a little bit more different uh, because of this very reduced style uh, which works with significant white space. But it makes uh, rather clean looking templates which are usually a cluttered mess because of all the special characters you usually need in your templating language. So we are here we have Ruby. Then we have, of course, Dancer, for example, which you have your root, and then you have your kitty root, and then you have your other kitty root with post and your parameter handling, and so on, and so on, and so on. And this is with a template toolkit, and here you have your parameter, and so on, and the URL, and this goes on and on and on. And here we have the same stuff with Mojolicious and Mojo's template and you have your roots and here you have your post for the kitties and get your parameters and here this looks totally different than any other templating stuff and so this goes on. And you can basically do this in almost every programming language in this kind of style one way or another. So, um, this is, if you really compare this side by side, this is really, um, okay, it's different programming languages, but uh, I mean, that doesn't really look that different at all. 
The style is uh, the, the underlying principles are always the same. You're setting up your roots one way or another. You're grabbing your parameters. And I deliberately named everything the same so you, it looks even more similar. And then you have, of course, templates. And this is really different, te different templating languages. So that is really, um, and it still isn't really that different. You have one way or another, you have the stupid parenthesis stuff um, and uh, some, well, let's call it as it is called in Perl, some Siegel or um, how would you call it something which re occurs afterwards, a, a post gill or something. So th this is actually a more complicated um, template element because there's a character more. So, okay, it isn't really that different, at least at a glance. So of course, the devil is in the detail with all the web frameworks. So what kind of helpers do you have, for example? Is validating stuff particularly easy or particularly annoying in your web framework? Do you have async support? Do you have WebSocket support? Um, do you have stuff like before and after rendering hooks, for example, where you can manipulate things more easily? Um, how does it look with your model integration and um, how um, seamless can you plug in um, ORMs? Um, how do you deal with sessions? What about authentication and authorization, which usually sucks in particular? Um, does it have something like plugins? Can you easily extend it or manipulate it? Um, how malleable is it really? Um, I mean, there's a lot of complaints that there is basically Rails programming and you have to do it the Rails way or it doesn't work. Um, and of course, does it have good documentation and does it have lots of folklore, um, best practices, examples and real applications you can actually take a look at? And that becomes more, even more relevant later. So is there anything else than these kinds of web frameworks? And I think there is and there's two different ways to think about web frameworks. There is um, the very loosely coupled web frameworks where you basically, um, which are usually used for service-oriented um, web applications, APIs, these kinds of things. It kind of goes back to, among other things, um, I don't know if you've ever read this, Steve Yegi's rant about Amazon about the difference in uh, programming culture at Google and Amazon. It's, I can highly recommend it because um, he explains, uh, talks a lot about the internal architecture of Amazon. Um, the more loose web frameworks are also usually very raw and expose everything for you. And you have, what you get with this is a very high level of control over the entire request and response cycle. The Tightly integrated web frameworks, which is a different category, um, are usually extremely integrated. Uh, they are very, very application oriented. They often feel like real graphical user interface programming. If you actually have used any kind of a widget set like a GTK, Qt, a Java, um, whatever Microsoft uh, recent library is called, um, they are kind of similar and they are usually rather dif different from web development even though you are writing a complex graphical user interface in a web application these days. And these web frameworks suddenly make it feel like real graphical user interface programming. Um, interestingly, they usually have something that they also wrap HTML and CSS completely away from you. They are usually rather component based. They come with everything out of the box and why on earth should you even bother with templates? So, um, I would categorize these web frameworks as from the very loose fraction. There's, for example, Erlang's web machine, which also has an implementation in Ruby and in Perl, and probably in a couple of more languages these days. Then there is the um, very worth looking at it, uh, web server Mongrel 2, 
um, which is uh, which has a really interesting concept. Then you can, of course, write uh, your web application based on raw plug. And that is actually what I've seen in a couple of communities as the recommended way to write your web applications these days. To not use a more higher level, more integrated web framework, but really to deal with this kind of stuff. And of course, back in the day, you had an extremely high level of control with Mod Perl, at least over Apache, of course. So then, like graphical user interfaces and very component-based and very tightly integrated are usually um, most Java frameworks I looked at, but also from the more interesting exotic side, um, Smalltalk's C side web framework and Air's Shiny web framework, which one simply has to use for the name alone, in my opinion. And those are particularly interesting because they have very awesome features. So let's take a look. If you're using web machine, has anybody used web machine in any language? Has any, does anybody know about web machine? Has heard about it? Okay, that is interesting. Um, web machine is a, it's more kind of a library than a framework. It has an, um, I don't have internet here on, uh, in a very fast way, do I? Okay. Web machine is really interesting because in web machine, um, you are basically exposing the entire s cycle and every step of the way your um, web request response cycle usually uh, goes through. So, and it exposes the stuff um, we are, in this case, this is the Perl example, um, we are um, functions and methods you get from web machine, um, which have uh, functions, for example, to uh, deal with caching, to deal with e-takes, to deal with all kinds of HTTP header stuff, with all kind of content negotiation and whatnot. This web, this framework is extremely HTTP oriented. It's not templating, HTML, CSS, user interface oriented. It really is um, made to deal with the protocol in a new and more interesting way. And then you take care of the actual details. So a little bit more of an example, this would be the Perl variety, and trust me, the Erlang variety is in no way more readable. Um, those are web machine methods. You're basically saying, okay, those are my allowed methods. And then you have, uh, for example, another web machine method where you actually deal with your post. And then you are saying those are the content types I'm providing. And then you basically, this of course uh, results in the appropriate HTTP header. And then you have point to functions where you actually deal with the, fill in the content types. And the interesting part is that you are um, dealing with a resource in a very um, direct way in a web machine. Who is really familiar with REST? I mean really, really familiar. Because the interesting part is, um, you know that in REST um, articles and in REST tutorials, it goes on and on and on about resources and resources and resources, and you should make nice URLs, and, in your, and the URL actually points to a resource. And this is what Web Machine gets you. This is example code from my kitty resource. This is one specific resource which handles get and post, and then it does stuff which is for the request and response cycle for this specific resource. If you have a more elaborate web application, you have usually like 50, 100 resources, and you would in Web Machine write um, basically a 
module um, for each and every resource. And for each and every resource, you can extremely fine-grained target how it is supposed to deal with the request and response cycle, what kind of headers it needed, what kind of caching strategy you would like to have. Would you like to have on this resource e tags and on another you won't, and so on and so on. Do you need fancy authorization and authentication on uh, your typical administration resources, and so on and so on. And this is really not, not about model view controller at all. This is really, you have your URL and it points to a resource and you're dealing with the resource for the request and response cycle and nothing besides it. It is, it sounds totally vague, strange, weird. You kind of really have to uh, work it to actually get it and it's weirdly simple so it makes it extremely difficult to explain so um, what it gives you is really this extremely high level of control which you in many web applications you you simply don't need you don't want to care in about the intricacies of status codes and um, headers um, which you then uh, which you need after a specific status code was triggered and so on and the flexibility is of course very awesome i mean you can really treat your resource completely differently as per resource and you can combine it with whatever you like. That is also for many people an advantage. So uh, it doesn't come with a templating system. So if you actually need to generate HTML, um, you can use whatever templating library you like. So it really simply doesn't care. Um, if you want more details, look, uh, it's written by Stephen Little. Um, if you want to have uh, two dozen examples um, of how to handle specific resources, look into an old talk of Stephen where he added uh, lots and lots of examples uh, in code in his GitHub. And you can, of course, always look in the Erlang original, but if you don't know Erlang, it's rather difficult to read, actually. So, of course, the disadvantages of this kind of web frameworks are pretty clear. You have to do everything by yourself, by hand. You really, really need to know HTTP, and it needs to be combined with other things. Otherwise, you're ending up with print statements for your HTML. So, then, the web server Mongrel is really interesting, and that is really just to give you a peek. Who has ever used 0MQ? Okay, then I'm probably not going to belabor this, but the interesting part is that you are setting up a route, and then you are pointing to a 0MQ handler, which can be on a completely different host, uh, run in any programming language which actually supports 0MQ and then does its thing and sends the stuff automatically back so that you actually can display this. This is really interesting um, if you, for example, uh, would have uh, 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 which does video conversion or in a image conversion on the fly, then you are, of course, trying to do this heavy load stuff on a different machine. And then you basically can make a conversion service out of it or something like it. And this is a really interesting concept, but sadly, Mongrel 2 is a little bit weird with um, configuration saved in SQL Lite and these kinds of things. But this concept I can highly recommend to actually look at. Um, so when would you lose these kinds of very loose web frameworks? Um, they are great for APIs when you're not generating complicated user interfaces, when you really want rest all the way, um, when you hate everything else and want to do your own stuff, then they are really, really, really helpful. Um, when you want to keep thi things small in terms of not being an enterprise architecture and simply because you can and you like it, of course. So, okay, the very tightly uh, coupled applications are really interesting. So, um, I'm assuming you all know next to nothing about small talk. So, um, let me first show you how small talk looks like. Small talk comes, other than w with GNU small talk, always with a graphical user interface. You program in this 
IDE, and it's very, very advanced. It comes with everything, ranging from versioning and um, whatnot. And the interesting part is Smalltalk usually is image-based. It's like Lisp, for example. So what you are getting is basically programming. Um, you're doing open heart surgery in your IDE. So if you need a new window, you just type on your workspace that you want a new window. Um, if you uh, manipul manipulate some object, you do it directly in this IDE. And usually, it's really it's updating everything immediately. So this is actually, um, if you want to experience something really, really different, um, give it a try. So the interesting part, though, is you have a web application. And of course, I've written this web applications, and I have here a style method, which gives this a different style. So, OK. This is, of course, the usual way to go. You edit on the server side your web application, and then you go back to your web application and reload the stuff. And then it usually has a different color, which I possibly should have chosen a little bit better. So the interesting part in I edited on the server, went back to the browser, and my web application has updated. The interesting part in the Smalltalk web framework is that it does work the other way around as well. I'm clicking in the browser the web application itself into a kind of development mode. I get exposed my methods, my small talk methods, in the browser. I change color. I accept this. And then, of course, this happens. Ah, oh, that is so awesome. Ah, it has a bug. So usually, I should be able to edit this method all the same in the browser itself. And then I could go. Ah, now it worked. Awesome. OK. So I changed the color live in my application. And now the interesting part, I can go back on the server, and the server changed its code along with it. And that is really such an awesome concept that you basically can just edit your web application in browser, and it transpires back onto the server. And this is possible because um, the Seaside web framework uses so-called continuations, which are basically directly going into the running Smalltalk image. So, and that is in my opinion, a really interesting concept, because imagine you have a very complex graphical user interface, then simply clicking some typical, the button is not properly centered bug into the development mode in your web application, edit it in browser, just press a button, and it immediately transpires onto the server and gets versioned, and everything is really just extremely convenient. So this is really in my opinion, an extremely nice feature of this particular framework. And it goes in both directions. So you edit on the server, it updates on the client. You edit in the client, and it updates on the server. It doesn't matter. So um, the advantages and an interesting argument in terms of the uh, uh, in terms of the small talk web framework is that 99% of all websites sites are small, so you don't have to scale. So it's all about the convenience to actually do web development the easy way. Um, it is the object-oriented language of all languages, so it is very very worthwhile learning it anyway. It's a very nice language actually. Um, and they invented almost everything anyways. And um, OK, 
Um, if you know small talk and if you know graphical user interfaces, it's an extremely smooth web framework to use. Um, and you never basically touch HTML or CSS um, on your own because it's all methods, all objects, all the way. So it's of course extremely alien when you're coming from regular um, kinds of web frameworks. It's really difficult to get actually into it other than actually writing your usual hello world. You better really know object-oriented program and I mean really, really know. Um, it's extremely tightly integrated into Smalltalk and it is kind of a ghetto language um, problem similar to Lisp. If you're not doing everything in it and with it, then you have difficulties to communicate with the outside world. For example, you can't uh, simply uh, version this in GitHub because you get a binary image when you save the application. Um, there's extremely, there's lots and lots of magic going on uh, in the background, so if anything fails, as you have just seen, you're completely at a loss. You usually can't even Google the error message, and you usually probably have triggered some kind of bug. Um, and there's, of course, no folklore about it and no examples in the wild, so you can't download 10 um, Smalltalk web applications and simply look at it and um, take inspiration from it. So then, ours Shiny is equally interesting. Um, the people who have used R, you probably have used it uh, for statistics and a little bit of making nice charts, I'm guessing. So mm, this is R. And uh, now look closely if I actually choose something. I don't get a page reload, but of course I get a perfectly updated image. So, and now look really closely. You get live updates all the way. And now imagine this, um, look at the examples on um, Shiny's website. They are doing lots and lots of stuff with statistics and charts, which are all where you have um, some kind of uh, uh, a button and can regulate and change everything, and it all updates live in all your charts. And that's actually pretty awesome. Um, and they are uh, basically working in a similar fashion uh, like uh, Seaside is working. R is also image-based, so you are running an image, and then you have all your data and all your stuff up and running in it. And um, they basically hide everything from you, so you write an R application and not a web application. The weird thing is, um, this is the entire application. I'm serving the cat pictures and have an input field and um, live update and these kind of things. This is all I have to do for, for, for it. It is completely alien, completely different than any other web framework. And if you're really dealing with um, R, that is really, <laughs> I mean, it's a language well, it's actually, <laughs> it's a thing which is supposed to be used. And then it has a programming language. And um, most people really know us as the statistics thing. And um, you use a ton of statistics function and a ton of charting functions and you get immediately uh, awesome results from it. And that is how you're supposed to deal with R. So you, you, you're usually, if you look in an average R handbook, you usually have like two pages about the programming language. The rest is about the usage of R. It's really interesting. But it's really extremely productive and I can highly recommend it. So um, it has exceptionally uh, good documentation in general. And what is really cute, um, they have something like Perl CPAN and it's called CRAN because the modules are called CRANberries. I really love that. Um, so also the web framework Shiny in particular has really, really nice examples. So go on the website of our studio and really look through it. It's quite awesome actually. So, okay, the magic, 
I mean it, I mean it. I looked, for example, in the equivalent of test more in R, and it's absolutely, well, simply look at it as a sta statistician and don't look at it as a developer and you will be totally happy with R. It, it's a totally special interest thing, of course. Um, if you don't do charting and statistic, you usually don't use R. Um, but it's really, really extremely practical. So, if you, when would you actually use, I've seen, when would you actually use these kinds of web frameworks like R and C site? Um, if you just want this little thing, then it's really unbeatable. Um, if you hate templates, then they are totally awesome. Um, and uh, if, you are, if you have a constantly changing but very long-running web application, which, which totally isn't about how fast you can get your application up and running, but how productive you can use, uh, you can change it over a decade, then they are, of course, very interesting, and, of course, you simply might like them. So the interesting part is uh, where is the web actually going? You have... Um, interesting things in almost all functional languages, for example, wrap HTML and CSS completely away from you. They're usually doing this as uh, methods like in Seaside or as functions like, for example, uh, in a couple of things you can use with closure. That, for example, is it, it totally moves away from templates. There's the really, really interesting concept of CouchDB, where your database basically uh, is served, uh, uh, speaks HTTP, and you really write your web application in CouchDB. I would totally love to have this in Postgres, for example. So um, then you have, of course, uh, the recent development of service-oriented web applications, where you have a very slim API and get, for example, a very heavy web front, uh, front end with all the recent JavaScript front ends. For example, React.js is one of the favorites these days. And I gave this talk 10 months ago, and 10 months ago it looked like um, the JavaScript frameworks Derby and Meteor would be really be awesome and taking off, and it doesn't seem to be like this. So. But this is, in my opinion, things to think about for uh, web applications. So if I would have to make a choice, um, they all have advantages and disadvantages. Um, Flask, in particular, has really, really good documentation and tutorials, especially the Flask Mega tutorial. Um, in terms of VIP aptitude, Shiny is unbeatable. You don't even have to know the language. Um, Modulicious is, in my opinion, one of the smoothest web frameworks I've ever used. Um, in terms of cool features, when they actually work, Seaside is absolutely unbeatable. Um, the community is extreme around Dancer is extremely nice, so if you're a, a beginner and rely on communities a lot, then this is the way to go. My personal taste, Web Machine, simply because this concept somehow appeals to me. And, um, okay, in terms of shortcut, why would you even need a web framework when you can simply surf your data out of the database with HTTP? So, final thoughts is, um, in the end, of course, all the cool stuff is totally worthless. I mean, I wrote this stupid cat application in over a dozen languages, at least I tried, and I get stuck in the exotic stuff. And then, because it's buggy or broken somehow, it's not really used somewhere in the wild, so you're trying to do real stuff and it doesn't work. Um, it has almost no documentation, which of course is usually a huge problem with the exotic stuff. It has no communities to speak of. It's really, really, really alien, um, or it doesn't play well with others. And um, does anybody remember the Reddit rewrite from Lisp to Python? Reddit started out as a Lisp application, and then they rewrote the entire thing and used Python. And they wrote a really interesting article about it. Google it. It's really um, very worth reading. Um, and, and it was simply because of the so much better environment of Python. You have more libraries. You have more modules. You don't have just one 
XML module, you have three, like in Perl. You have choices all of a sudden. And I can't stress this enough, even if you're tempted with the exotic stuff, this environment thing will fall onto your feet very, very hard. And in that regard, if you know the um, Richard Gabriel article about worse is better, um, popular and worse actually is better. So, and also, thanks a lot. And this is, by the way, how cat pictures end up on the internet for real. So, thank you very much. Also, let me let you go home with this. That's, I think that's the cutest one in my entire collection of really cute pe cat pictures. So, um, do I have a minute for questions? Does anybody even have a question? Yeah, stick with the web framework you're using anyways. <laughs> <laughs> no, really, in the, end, in, the end, in the end, it's exactly what I did after trying each and every I'll stick with the ones I actually know and use regularly. Like that, okay. Um, I'm doing a uh, large data in uh, Kairos DB, yeah. and I need to present it to end users. Would R be a good solution? Uh, that, de that depends on how much data you would actually like to shove into the front end. Um, but uh, if I would have to go with what is the best visualization library for user uh, for, for to use in browser, um, D3. 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 It's from the uh, visualization developer of the New York Times, um, and it's absolutely it's really I can't rave about it enough. It's very well documented. It has over 100 examples. It looks absolutely awesome. It is extremely flexible. It is very, very nice done, nicely done, and you simply shove JSON in it. Your data comes as JSON in, and then you treat it in JavaScript as usual, so to speak, and uh, it's really making the most flexible and best um, visualizations of any kind of data. So on your server side end, just generate JSON, period. Thank you very much. Uh, I have a D3 example. I can show you, show it to you on the notebook. So if you're interested, okay.